Hello. Hello. This is a very exciting edition of Briar Rose Book Club because we are Together. in the same place. <laughs> we are yeah. in the same place. Very, very exciting. And we are very ready to talk about the June book, The Behemoth. Wait. Mammoth. Plain, but why is yours bigger than mine? Oh, because <laughs> of distance from the camera. <laughs> Play bad arrows! And we're going to wait a minute for people to trickle in because at the minute I think it is literally just us watching ourselves to make sure it doesn't go wrong. So, <laughs> I'm getting out. It's literally just us. <laughs> <laughs> it is it just is us. Just... <laughs> um, to the tweet. I don't know why I wasn't doing it before. Oh no, we are live. Oh, hello! Kieran is here! Kieran is the first person hello. here! You're the first person to the party! Very exciting. I'm going to tweet this again. We are live! Be there or be square. No, I'm not going to say that. We're... What? Liver. <laughs> We're live! Alright. Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. So, as we've said, the book of June was Plain Bear Heroin. Insane, <laughs> this is unrehearsed, aren't we smooth? Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. Big book. Yeah. <laughs> We we both kind of struggled with it. Yeah. Both because of the length and because of we think, you know, some things in the yeah. book. We'll, we'll get um, on to that. We'll get on to it. We do tell have us how you feel. Yeah. yeah, tell us how you feel as well about those who've read the book. Yeah. How you got on with it. Yeah. So if you're joining us and you haven't read it, I'll do a quick synopsis in the best way that I can, although this discussion Please. might have spoilers in it later on but we will warn you again when those crop up um so we begin the book in 1900 1902 1902 in um rhode island rhode island <laughs> <laughs> on the coast at a place called book haunts book haunts yeah book haunts um, school for girls school for girls and um i like that you took over <laughs> and it basically starts with two girls who are obviously in a romance at, um, together that their family and people at the school and some of their friends disapprove of. Um, and one of the girls, Clara, has just been back in Newport, I think, at home um, because one of the teachers alerted their parents to, you know, their kind of bad behaviour. Um, Lesbianism. And, and she's, and she's, um, so basically they had a, um, what do you call it? They, well, they said that she can't, um, can no longer see her girlfriend Flo and that she's a bad influence. Um, and, um also that she can she has to get rid of this book that has taken both girls they kind of got obsessed with it and it's um called the story of mary mclean which we'll get into a bit more later but it is a actual book it's not one that emily danforth um made up for the novel um which is kind of interesting um we both hadn't heard of it before. no no um and so um she's dropped off clara's dropped off by her cousin charles and um he's basically arguing with her um and she runs off um into some of the school grounds into towards this orchard which is a kind of romantic meeting place for her and um Low, and she, whilst running there she gets caught up in a wasp's nest mm -hmm. and um Flo tries to help her um but they both die from 
been stung a lot. Yeah. And and it's then it goes on to kind of more and more happenings, um, bad kind of scary happenings, people dying with this book. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you want to do a bit about the kind of movie present day? Yeah. Goes- so we obviously kick off with this very striking image of these two young girls in love dying a really horrific and painful death. Also, hi, Shah. Um, and then we sort of find out that this this starts a chain of events, basically, at the school, like really kind of gothic, spooky things. Um, and then we sort of cut to modern day, and we don't really know why at, at, at the beginning. And then we find out that we're following an actress called Harper Harper, and that she has just been cast as Flo in the new film adaptation, horror film adaptation of... Um, what happened at Brooke Hunt School and the film is called Happening at Brooke Hunt. Um, and we basically follow the production of this film and we switch back and forth. So we're following the production of the film as we're learning more about what actually happened back mm-hmm. then in 1900. And the events sort of start to mirror each other, but then there's also differences and more people come in to the fray. There's quite a lot of characters to yeah, follow. There's a massive, I'll show you, I keep <laughs> track of the characters I made like a thing with a, a little summary and it's <laughs> like there's just like I mean you can't see because of the light but there's just like and that's one thing that I think mm. is a bit of a disadvantage mm-hmm. of the book actually because I think a lot of characters were kind of repetitions of other yeah characters um but it was i mean it's a big accomplishment to have yeah to her to have done this book because it's quite a complicated narrative with multiple different time periods because you also go back um into the kind of late 1800s um and kind of find out this love story between the headmistress um Libby Brookhance and her lover um Alex um Trills Trills, Trills yeah and who also works at this yeah and that and that kind of mirrors Flo their younger relationship mirrors Flo and Clara and mm-hmm. and it's so there's a lot of different things happening and it's kind of it's non-linear changes to yeah it was just too long we love that silence yes. the silence as we yes. read the comments yes. <laughs> uh, i mean we've talked about and also i think both of us were also quite you know disappointed with the ending as well we'll, we'll get, to that. get to yeah. that but um, we'll be really interested to hear your thoughts on it because yeah. we also found it quite confusing mm. as well. <laughs> Honestly, I'm um, sitting here like sweating a little bit because I'm like, I I don't know how this book ends, and I've read it. Um, yeah, it's it's a difficult. Yeah, yeah. I did I'm, get the sense that obviously I felt that potentially the length was justified if we were really really building to something quite big um and you think okay this is a slow burn and we're setting up all of these really subtle tensions like on set between the actors and the writer of the original book and we're setting up all of these little the things the writer of um, the happenings at brook Hans, which is a kind of book about the story of Brooke Hunt so it's not the Mary McLean yeah. one it's it's confusing because there's like <laughs> lots of books different within <laughs> books yeah. and so she's a um, 21 year old who wrote The Happening at Brooke Hunt's which is like a non-fiction account yeah non yeah, yeah a non-fiction cool. account and she and then, her, like 16 yeah something. and then that's so. what's being adapted so she's like this prodigy yeah. she's like a bit of an ass anyway like oh someone's like calling their cat um mm-hmm. she's like a bit of an asshole she's sort of like this young prodigy but then she's also struggling with like what to write next so she's just quite insecure and i think from that comes like this sort of protective layer where she doesn't like to like pretend to care about things so we have these three very different women in the modern day we have Harper Harper the actress we have Audrey another actress and then we have Merritt who's the author of the book that they're in the film of and they really do set up these tensions between them and you you know start to see spooky things happening on set and it very much um you know Blair Witch Project is mentioned in the text as one of the core inspirations you know visually and also um thematically just 
uh, Emily Jamworth was inspired by kind of, you know, spooky s stories, you know, like the kind of famous ones from Poltergeist, mm -hmm. how they used, I think, real bones in the scene. Yeah, so some like, people, there's a big like, horror history died of, or yeah, certain, like, big, actors died. big, big horror film history of people that have been cursed by mm. filming these ghost stories, mainly it's ghost stories, people that have been haunted on sets, and this is like a really rich kind of cult thing. Mm like a cult history and like a cult <laughs> um but the the novel does does pay homage to that and really you know plays up that aspect of it and i don't know if it quite delivered like there wasn't a lot for me on set that was really quite unnerving and i was waiting for that big moment maybe towards the end where all of these small tensions that i've been building would really pay off and then you sort of get a little bit of a payoff in the sort of past uh timeline but then again we'll talk about why that doesn't quite wrap yeah. things up completely one thing i found really interesting is that i i w listened to like an interview with emily Danworth just before this chat and she said she started writing the book um she wrote it for eight years so it was oh, wow. over a long mm. period of time and what i was kind of kind of sh shocked for me was that she started the narrative wanting to write about um curses that have taken over you know like movie mm -hmm. curses so she actually didn't start with what i think we probably both agree the more kind of developed and interesting aspect is the bit set in the 1900s but mm -hmm. she didn't actually start with that interesting um and also the the bit about the curses on set is quite minimal i mean it's just like a sort yeah. of article where you like read it, it and it and it describes you know spooky things happening but yeah um that is interesting because it, yeah you wonder yeah. with a huge book like this the first thing you wonder is yeah what what was the starting point how did all of these different threads come together like because obviously an idea like this doesn't just arrive fully formed it'll come in like you know bits and pieces and that's really interesting to know that that's not yeah, the first thing that she it's, thought it's interesting because i i kind of feel like my personal opinion it was like a long project and it was kind of started on this area and then she kind of said how you know when she was in her 20s she kind of started having a bit of an obsession about mary mclean mm. and she kind of revisited that and she was saying how, you know, she gets obsessed with things and starts just adding them into the book. And she said how she had to cut lots from oh, the Jesus. book <laughs> because she found that that's something that she gets too carried away with. And you can kind of see that. Yeah. And also, I think you could definitely see the, that in the footnotes for sure. Yeah. Uh, and also with the, you know, um, present day thing, I kind of almost feel like it was something she clinged on to not being able to bear letting that part of it go Maybe. when it was like the less mm. interesting part because I, I was we were looking at some like reviews just from people on, on goodreads and stuff and a lot of people said the same thing is that they kind of could have done without the modern present yeah. day bit but what yeah. do you guys think? <laughs> what do you guys think um yeah we have a little slideshow ready to go um I might just, oh, I want to do it full screen, but then I will be able to see your comments. All right, well, we've got them on. Oh, that's I true. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go full screen and get on to the first, well, I mean, there's our little intro page. Hello. <laughs> um, and the first sort of question that we want to discuss is who was Mary McLean? Because if you've read the book, you'll know that she plays a pretty integral part in the narrative. Um, and did you know of her and her work before reading Plain by Heroines? And I think we already touched on the fact that neither of us did. Mm. Um, but I think one thing that I think is universal, I mean, there's been lots of different people's, obviously everyone has a different experience when they read a book, but I think one thing that would be pretty universal is that you would come away from this book wanting to read Mary MacLean. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's yeah. self-explanatory because so much of the, the text and the kind of creepiness of it focuses on the alluring quality of Mary MacLean's work. Um, and the title itself, Plain Bad Heroines, is a, is a quote, a direct quote from one yeah. of Mary's books. Um, read out that bit. 
fit actually <laughs> well one one thing that i found a bit you know i out a bit like oh my god um is this not up hang on i can't see if the thing is on screen <laughs> wait no <laughs> she's talking nonsense it says clicked click to exit full screen no what is happening no hello Can people see no <laughs> it doesn't let me go <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it here. I'm just gonna leave it here. Okay. There we go. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> that's so weird. That's so unprofessional. I'm so sorry, everybody. The screen yes. shows. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvie. <laughs> oh goodness. Right. So you're just gonna have to have a little border there on Canva. Okay, my, yeah. my my secrets have been revealed. I'm I'm a Canva. I'm a Canva girl. <laughs> oh B, you're like Okay, there we go. Oh goodness. So anyway, I mean I said what I said, but <laughs> Mary McLean, she she was a really big part of the book. And I guess our main question is, you know, what do we think of her role in the novel and um did we know of her work and what sort of significance does it have? I've got a quote which is at the beginning of the book um, and I'll, I'll just read it out quickly. And it's an extract from the, yeah, yeah. From the Mac, story of Mary MacLean. It's like right at the beginning of Plain Bad Heroines. Um, there never seemed to be any plain heroines except Jane Eyre and she was very unsatisfactory. She should have entered into marriage with her beloved Rochester in the first place. I should have let there be a dozen, a dozen mad wives upstairs. But I suppose the author thought she must give her heroine some desirable thing, high moral principles, since she was not beautiful. Some people say beauty is a curse. It may be true, but I'm sure I should not have at all minded being cursed a little. <laughs> um, and I know several persons who might well say the same. But anyway, I wish someone would write a book about a plain bad heroine so that I might feel in, in real sympathy with her. And I, so that's the kind of quote that, you know, names both, you know, the book and, you know, the society. And this is the society. Oh, God. <laughs> societies um were a real thing at the time um despite mary mclean being a kind of unknown kind of person now you know her work's been in and out of print since it you know was first published in 1902 and but at the time it was like i think it sold 80,000 copies in the first month and there were you know um it was a huge hit with young girls and there was, you know, which is, this is described in the book as well as that there were drinks named after, you know, like people really did create societies um, based on her book and her mm. kind of character. Um, yeah, there's and... a really beautiful section of the book where Eleanor, who's another girl at the school, mm. begins to get obsessed with Mary McLean's book after finding it next to the bodies of Flo and Clara, who die at the very beginning. And there's just a very beautiful um, section that says, Eleanor Faderman knew many books, but never before had she read a book that mm. seemed to know her. Um, and I think, you know, almost that's sort of what this book is trying to achieve as well. Yeah. It's like, um, especially for queer girls as well, because it yeah. uh, makes a big thing of this book is that many of the main lead characters, lead women, are queer. Yeah, I don't think I've ever read anything mm -hmm. with so many, yeah. like, where everyone's kind of, um, you know, in a lesbian yeah romance. and i guess you know very taboo for the time but i think mary in her work states that she's openly bisexual yeah um and you know has fat passages about her attraction to women so for that time you you know if there were queer positive girls which i'm sure there were you know obviously mm -hmm. evidenced by the research that emily m danforth has done for this novel you know queer girls have always been around but that sort of is the first 
that they would get in terms of representation Mm -hmm. and so it makes sense that it takes on this sort of hypnotic almost like holy quality yeah and they sort of worship it like you know their bible in a sense yeah and I actually found um at the time there was uh there's like a Mary McLean kind of website um you could probably just google it um also hello Karis and Rowan so happy to have you here (laughs) <laughs> just making sure that we're looking at the comments so <laughs> yeah um there's um i got a kind of um thing from the mary mclean website um which kind of works to kind of keep her name around and mm-hmm. you know um there was had some um uh l- kind of letters and stuff that had come you know were sent into magazines at the time um and there's one one from um if you want to read it oh (laughs) i feel bad no you can read whatever you want to read is this a letter from somebody it's from lily may i be um new york new york Um, and she says, I have waited patiently to find some woman who agreed with me as to the genius of Mary McLean. I am still waiting. Surely there is one somewhere, for I cannot think that I am all alone in my opinion. That would stamp me as being oddly different, and I know I am just like all the others. I do not envy Mary McLean. The money she has earned, the popularity and public notice which have come to her, are hers by divine right. Mary McLean is a genius. She is a great genius, and in that she recognises herself and has had the courage to announce it. She distinctly portrays the wail of the human heart for that something that we never possess in this world. She appeals to the tragic side of life. This is serious. To be serious is to think. To think is to look inwardly. To be able to depict what you see there is sublime. Mary McLean's attitude is at all times introspective and therefore original. I cannot understand how anyone can condemn her. She tells the unvarnished truth. I can see the sand and barrenness in every life with which I come in contact. The man or woman who tries to make a life comedy fails just as miserably as he who takes it tragically. There is something insurmountable, inexplicable. It is this we should all like to do, but it has never been solved yet. We may possibly know it over there. Mary McLean knows her devil will enlighten her if she ever finds him, which of course she will. They come early to most of us. He can't take away the sand and barrenness, and she knows it. Now that Mary McLean is more than ever convinced of the monotony of appearances, the monotony of everywhere and every sameness in human nature. I hope she will give us something more from her pen that will be worthy of such a brain and such a personality as she possesses. Yeah. So, <laughs> I just thought that was quite nice to like get some context on how women kind of saw her at the time. Yeah. Um, and obviously as you can see by the pictures that we've got on screen she is a very sort of enigmatic presence you know she has this sort of air about her which is quite singular um you know gothic queen as you might say (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah it's interesting because obviously one of the things i first wanted to do upon finishing playing bad heroines was read mary mclean's work and it is really bloody difficult to get hold of um and i wonder if you know emily danforth anticipated that um or not because you know when bridgerton came on netflix and then everyone wanted to read it they just weren't ready for that amount of demand and they didn't have it sure there will be a reprint Mm. soon um i think there's been like various reprints over the years i think there may have been like one in 2013 or something but it's it's kind of seen still seems hard to get so it's like must have been a small batch of you know yeah. printing but um and it's kind of fitting almost as well that it sort of seems to belong to this small elite group of people yeah that that have managed to discover it anyway like i don't know how emily danforth came across it if it was like something that yeah. just happened by chance or it was recommended well, I th- or i think it's because um i think um mary mclean i think that she was born in canada but i think she may have kind of uh you know spent her teen years in montana which is also where um emily danforth grew up so i think she may have kind of heard about her yeah like a local it was like a local yeah um 
but I don't know because then she said sh she found out more about it in her 20s so I I, mm. I don't really know I mean yeah maybe it was just something that she you know um, Emily Danforth is obviously a, she's a um, queer woman so maybe it was something that she naturally kind mm. of stumbled upon, stumbled upon. Yeah, for sure. um, but yeah so um did, did anyone who's watching know of her before this book um and do you think that you'll you're likely seek to seek stuff, out yeah. her work um yeah one thing that i did find um strange is is, is that the kind of excerpts from her book kind of worked it more powerful to me than Emily Danforth's writing <laughs> which yeah. which you know like uh, I mean some parts of the book are really you know of Emily Danforth's book are really beautifully written especially the ones set in um, 1902 and the kind of late 1800s but I did feel at times like oh I want to read that more yeah than yeah and also because it is such an integral part of the book you know these girls at this school are you know absolutely entranced and then later on the principals end up kind of confiscating the books from the girls and then they can no longer read Mary McLean and then um the principal's lover Alex also becomes slowly bewitched and she goes gradually insane and it's all to do with this book and this book seems to be linked to the curse and then we get that ending which sort of yeah, which kind takes of, it in a different direction. It, um, the ending, um, I mean what, what do you guys think of the ending? <laughs> I feel like it was a mistake to be like oh wait the curse and everything isn't actually about the book at all. Yeah. It's about, it kind of felt like a bit of a slap in the face. Yeah it was a bit strange because I thought as well you know obviously it takes place in 1902 the sort of timeline in the past and not that i didn't think they were gonna like go and meet her but i thought there would be some sort of element because she's, she's alive at that time she's alive and she's writing and there's some sort of allusion to like she spends the summer on rhode island but she's like sort of a bit you know people try she and track did. her down but she's a bit elusive and i just thought like you know she as yeah she might appear in some way or there might be some sort of follow-up you know some sort of resolution you know that, was she aware of the effect her book was having i mean obviously i think the, yeah, sort of, the deaths are fictional yeah. but i don't know if she was yeah i don't she, know she says in an interview in the book so you know this is obviously mm -hmm. fictional talking about flora and flora i think she is reported saying something like oh i wish i knew those girls or something oh. um and and at the time, I mean, like, I, you know, would be interested to look more into it, but I don't think there were, you know, real instances of, of death, of yeah. de you know. Um, actually, I, to, I might have heard, heard there but might have been something, mm. actually, um, you know. But I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it was, of, you know, banned in certain places, yeah. especially for young girls, you know. Um, yeah, you know, there's quite a lot of resistance yeah. against it as well. Yeah. And um, some people have commented yeah, saying, yeah, so. I put them on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's definitely one that. We, Maybe we, we can we, do a separate we, little we, Mary McLean. Yeah, <laughs> um, we, can sit, we, we were talking about it while, while we were reading it and we were like saying, you know, should we do it? as you know one month as part of our book club but one thing we were concerned by is that how accessible it is mm. um so actually the other night rowan did find a pdf of it, of which it. is yeah, a bit which, illegal but i mean <laughs> i mean it's, it's you know i mean it I is over a hundred years old so. copyright well. well yes so. it's over a hundred years old in um, public domain maybe that's why she published it because now yeah, because it's maybe because, out of public domain yeah i don't know yeah, but um, it would be nice to know if, you know, if anyone you're, reads uh, interested it. Interested <laughs> in us maybe doing that later. Mm -hmm. That would yeah. be cool. Yeah.
And we'll move to the next one. Ready for the next discussion point. Um, oh my god, no, I'm on the wrong bloody slide. I feel like, you know, like a university lecturer that can't work with technology and I always used to roll my eyes, but now I get it. <laughs> oh, this is a fun one. What is the significance of Brookhunt School as the primary location of the novel? And this honestly was the thing I love most about the novel was the descriptions that we get of Brookhunt's and its various different buildings because there's like the main building and then there's the sort of you go on a journey and then there's like the principal's quarters where she lives which is called Spike Tower and then which is there is yeah. actually a Spike Tower but it's mm. not like how it's you know it's in the book it's like connected to the um yeah. I've forgotten the name of the place the orange room no, no, no the, the orchard um, no the um breakwater yeah, it's that's the name of the building where um, Libby Brookhunt's the, um, the principal and her lover Alex kind of reside, um, which is kind of you know near to the main school um, building. But um, this there's apparently is actually a spiked tower in in um, Rhode Island. Oh, yeah. But a pet, and it has this kind of similar kind of mm. legend about two brothers who oh. who wanted you know to spoil another's view. But that that's kind of she was kind of slightly influenced by that. Obviously, mm. we then have the ending, which is <laughs> it's just the <laughs> ending. <laughs> yeah, but um, I mean we we're both um talking about this question about book. Brooke Hans and just having a girls' school as the kind of location where, you know, there's all this kind of sapphic love and, mm. you know, kind of um, we're both, me and Erin are both super interested in kind of like the idea of liminality. Mm. And um, I actually, I did my dissertation on um, the depiction of girls' schools in um, visual culture and, and, Kind of looked a lot of, about how it's a kind of liminal space you know obviously there's a liminality of kind of girlhood and teenagehood you're in between being a child and an adult but also the space itself it's it's like a kind of bubble um it's you know a kind of it's not you know reality you know you're kind of detached from detached the from, yeah. detached and and as it you know talks about in in the book you know there's um which at one point um merit you know discusses with harper um uh so the writer of the happenings at brooke hunts just you know discusses with the um kind of main actress um in the film adaptation and you know harper's kind of going you know do, is this true that people that women actually did have you know kind of girl crushes and and kind of um you know um there rituals, is a lot of yeah. you know rituals and you know kind of things like you see in picnic at Henley rock and you know um and and she was like yeah and and i i feel like that is a thing in girl schools even kind of now yeah like, <laughs> we both yeah. went to girl, um, um, yeah. the same girl school and um yeah and it's interesting. It's, yeah, it's I think of... I found the bit um, yeah, is... where Harper is at, she says, it's still kind of bananas to think of the way back then. I mean, not to be too modern or whatever, but it all seems pretty fucking queer to me. Um, sure, Merritt said, if you were a well-to-do wasp from New England whose parents sent you off to school and you wanted to experience a few years of probably chaste but intense romantic courtship before you ended up marrying a man, who would make all your future life decisions while you birthed him many a baby and raised them up only to send some off to war and all the others into a system of slavery in rich US heteropatriarchal capitalism then absolutely it was queer city um so I think that's interesting it's like not I mean obviously I'm sure some of the girls were genuinely queer but yeah. I think that's also interesting like in the context of the time maybe girls school is your sort of last adventure before you settle before down you, into this yeah, weird and like boring housewife existence it's and so like sad. America <laughs> it's yeah quite, 
Uh, it's it is. I found it quite. And putting weird. it in that context, you can sort of see how easily it is to be swept up by a diary like this that sort of lays bare the thoughts yeah. that you don't think you're allowed to have. You know, if you're facing this sort of life that's just been chosen for you as a woman, you know. It, it does seem like a pretty great alternative to just say screw it and like elope with a lady. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I I liked you know um you know yeah it's it's kind of interesting how you know that Merritt also discussed how it was kind of seen as kind of play love, um, which obviously wasn't true. The, you know quite a few I mean all all the you know main characters in the book I'd say including Eleanor mm -hmm. um, who you know was a kind of quiet girl who didn't you know ever act on um, her kind of feelings really but um, got obsessed with obviously Mary McLean's book and also had a, a crush on a girl called Grace mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah it's interesting and i see R rowan said can i read your dissertation and yes <laughs> yes yes um yeah no i think again the this place of Brooke, like, that's why i think we both agreed that the sections that were in the past were a lot more compelling because it is very gothic and, and there's a quote on the front of the book itself from queen sarah waters who's like queen of you know queer fiction gothic fiction says that the book is brimming with sly humor and gothic mischief brilliant and i that is a, a gothic tale of you know young impressionable innocent young women taken away to usually like a castle somewhere or some place this grand palace where they are you know corrupted by like a mm. vampire or a count or a prince or something yeah, I, I and I, I quite like the idea of throwing that on its head and that the place that young girls get corrupted is a place full of other young girls and and they get sort yeah. of swept up by each other and not by some random man you not know so, that yeah. just comes in <laughs> yeah I, I mean I, I guess you know kind of there's a lot of kind of queer stories in the in the gothic genre I mean you think of Car Carmilla and you know um Dracula and you know um it is a kind of way historically that people have kind of expressed those desires um where they've been able to say but wait actually it's a monster <laughs> but no you know, yeah and you're like you know. It's like when you know Shakespeare wanted to critique the government and then just set it on a desert island in the Tempest, and I was like, this isn't anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yes. I find that really, really interesting. It's like you know, if you've got a backdrop of Gothic, you know, the Gothic is about corruption. It's about the perverse, and there's a sort of if you're not hiding behind it, but if you're writing in that genre, you can explore things that are traditionally taboo, and it doesn't necessarily come off as an endorsement as it would if you were writing in a different yeah. genre. Yeah, exactly. uh, and I did think in terms of the kind of present day um, and you know 1900s thing you know I think she did Emily Dunworth did mean to kind of mirror the kind of liminal space of the girls school with this production that mm. is has a lot of queer actors you know all the um you know, Harper and Audrey and Merritt are all queer. Um, so it is both kind of places are kind of the, uh, a safe place. Um, yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, and I think yeah. it's interesting as well. I mean, I, I probably should have said this in the, in the last one, but, but like the title playing bad heroines and you're thinking, okay, I get that it's meant to be all of them. But are there characters that you think fit that more than others? Because, you know, I guess in in the past you've got what you would consider like the ringleaders of this sort of, you know, like Libby. You find out that, you know, Libby has a friend, Sarah, who brings her these like, you know, sexy slides of, you know, women posing together. Mm -hmm. And it's very secretive and they all gather and they laugh about them. And it's from Sarah that I think she gets a copy of the book. 
and then yeah, from... she gives it to Flo. So there's like this sort of chain of command. But it's from, um, yeah, it's from Sarah to, well, but first of all from um, somebody, a- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from a- Addy, which if you haven't read it, that's a spoiler. You just, you can't say that's a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> you said the spoiler. I assume but if people are 39 from, minutes into the live show, yeah, they might have read the book. So To Sarah and then to Libby and then Libby, the headmistress, gave it to the girls, um, Claire. Claire and Clara. And, you know, that wasn't kind of... I don't, I don't know if it's ever known by Alex that she was the one who gave no, I, I mean, it must be known because she, you know, found that, you know, Sarah had written a note, sp- a me, note yeah. in the book. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think, like, because the way that Mary describes playing bad heroine is like a, a plain woman. Yeah. And none of the women really strike me as plain. And I wonder if it's sort of like mm. maybe an oxymoron of like, we're all plain bad heroine. Like, you know, just daring to be queer at that time made you bad, you know. Um, or you know like exotic yeah. or whatever i mean I, I i guess there's lots of you know kind of um like Flo and harper and you know kind of um you know what what do you call it kind of go against the kind of feminine norms of mm-hmm. the time like by wearing kind of masculine clothing and yeah. stuff and you know that sometimes you know discusses kind of plain because we're not kind of going with the kind of decadent you know women's fashion at that time which is obviously in the kind of gilded Mm. age which is you know kind of an age where you know the rich you know kind of upper class were super super wealthy and had so much money that they you know didn't know what to do with it (laughs) um yeah Mm. Yeah, which is in its own way a kind of liminal time because exactly, it's like yeah. you know before you know the World War One and you know before yeah. You know, in and I think our next question is actually about the split dual timeline, which would be interesting to get some different viewpoints on because I think we definitely had a preference for which one we preferred but it would be interesting to see if um, any of you guys did yeah so the next question that we have to discuss with you all is how do the past and present timelines echo or differ from each other was there one you preferred to read and I'll give you guys a few minutes to answer the question and then we can discuss (laughs) what we think (laughs) it would be interesting to see if there's you know like we much prefer the modern day because we didn't um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that i you know like i liked parts of it but i you know i think the pro- problem i had with the modern day is that there were a lot of characters that kind of cropped up that were never really talked of much again you know like annie who's um harper's girlfriend and i and i I kind of assume that maybe she was there to kind of introduce the kind of the fact that, you know, Harper was kind of polyamorous mm-hmm. and stuff. But I mean, they could have done that without like giving her, her yeah. a girl, you know, yeah, having yeah. her have a girlfriend. And, um, and, and then there was also, um, you know, Audrey had a kind of best friend. Eric? No, I think no. that was Harper's. It's no, 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 not the scene. Which I We're already so, losing. Which I, <laughs> and I fa- just found that kind of dynamic between Audrey and Noel and Harper and Eric like kind of too similar. Mm. And obviously, Noel comes up, yeah. up up again a bit later when you know they have this yeah. gig that they're filming. Yeah. Um, as part of the film. Mm. Um, but I just felt like there was a lot of characters that just kind of, you know, you know, even things like, you know, Caroline, I thought she would come up a lot more. I found the Caroline end. so interesting and I thought yeah. she would be much more involved in Audrey's narrative. And she sort of is, but then Audrey's but such a small part of the larger yeah. picture that Caroline has to be an even smaller part. 
Um, so she, she, Caroline is Audrey's mother, who yeah. was an '80s screen queen. Um, so she has a horror background, and what's um, it's quite nice actually because in real life, in our real life, um, Jamie Lee Curtis was uh, a screen queen in Halloween, and her mother Janet Lee was the screen queen in Psycho. So there is like a real mm-hmm. sort of mother daughter screen queen vibe, and then mm-hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis was in the show Screen Queens. <laughs> um, so there is that sort of link between, like you know, sort of like the horror genre I mean and you can tell that there's lots of, of research that Emily Danforth has done into that genre and the references are very crystal clear and as a film student ex-film student I really appreciated that but I wanted more of a handle on what the film was actually going to be because there's and that's I think what let down the modern storyline a little bit for me was that I liked the characters again I, I agree with you that there were just too many to keep track of and ones that there were scenes that did repeat themselves like you know Harper meeting her girlfriend and Harper going out with mm. her friend and then Harper taking Mera out on the telly there were lots of really Mera, repetitive I, I, scenes I, yeah. um but where it sort of fell down more for me was that we get a reveal about midway through the book so quite a lot of pages have been read by this point that the film is not what the actor all the actors think it's going to be so Audrey gets pulled aside by the director Bo and gets told that as well as filming the sort of fictionalized version of what happened at Brooke Hans, there's also going to be a documentary element where there will be secret cameras filming Audrey and Harper um, and what's Merit. going on sort of and Merritt what's going on in between takes on the set itself so sort of like you know, taking inspiration from Blair Witch, sort of like a found footage, and Bo in the edit was going to weave the real story of Brooke Hans, you know, acted out by these actors, in with the like, actual footage of these actors in between takes and, they're, they're, um, they're and everything. And all these kind of set up tricks to kind of... Yeah, and they have, yeah, like smoke and mirrors yeah. and like, you know, weird noises and special effects. And it's, yeah. you know, right way through, it's unclear what is actually special effects and part of the... yeah you know plan of the production and what is actually yeah. maybe actual real creepy yeah things. and I think that really got me excited for the bit where we get on set because it was that whole like what's real what's not real who knows about this like how is it gonna turn out and I just didn't feel like that really came to anything uh, yeah. for me anyway and um yeah, because they, I think, you know, they wanted to capture some sort of salacious event in between mm-hmm. filming and that didn't really happen for for a mm-hmm. lot of it. And I just, as, <laughs> I'm being annoying, but as like a director, I just couldn't get a handle on how that would weave together. I just didn't, mm-hmm. I just couldn't see it in my head. Mm-hmm. Like, I loved the concept and like this, this idea of, you know, Audrey knowing and the others being in the dark and having to like set them up for different things and I thought that was interesting like playing them off against each other and that could really result in some sort of like Mm -hmm. trickery and and, like real big conflict and it just didn't really come to much and then I just couldn't see what the point was because like what juicy content did Bo get in the in between bits that you wouldn't really like you would like really want to see basically it's just it's a bit weird because basically you know you we uh, there's quite a lot of comments by the way um, (laughs) i saw um but we you Mm. know there's this you know we find out what's you know happening when they start filming um and we know oh my god as readers (laughs) as readers we know that audrey is in on it um, mm-hmm. And we suspect Harper because she's a producer. Yeah. Um, and we suspect maybe Merritt too because she's um, friends with Elaine, very close with Elaine, who's, who's financing film. Who's mm-hmm. yeah financing the film and also is owns the Brooke Hunt's property. Mm-hmm. She's a you know um, relative. Yeah, um, I think this is true as well. What Karis has pointed out that, that there is an imbalance there. And just, you know, yeah. looking at it as like a whole piece of fiction, you know, what, what, yeah, why, why were we spending so much more time in the, in the setting when the least amount of stuff happens? Does that make yeah. sense? Because like, I, the, whole the, p- the period is... timeline is like eventful with a bunch yeah. of deaths, whereas there's this only one slow. very underwhelming death in, in the modern Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Like, they have to get to know. Yeah. I think this is true. The characters seemed a lot more interlinked. And I get that obviously Merritt and Harper 
and Audrey were meeting for the first time in the yeah. modern storyline. So we weren't obviously we their plot lines didn't directly affect each other, yeah. and we spent time with them individually. But I do think that that's what made the past a bit more cohesive because you could really buy into these relationships very quickly. You know, these young girls just swept up in love, and then the principal trying to get it under control, and you know her girlfriend and lover getting swept up in it too that was a lot more compelling to me than people meeting and and talking for the first yeah. time <laughs> yeah no I'm glad it's not just it's not just us because I did I was sort of you know in the reading process like I was always waiting to get back to the period setting yeah, because that's definitely. where the, the bulk of the narrative was happening um yeah, yeah. I agree yeah yeah exactly because you know like you we said you know there was sort of on set there was things that you could explain away by being the effects and there, there was this one section that i i did quite enjoy in the modern when they you know when they all take drugs <laughs> yeah. they get they get slipped this weird hallucinogenic tea where basically one of the girls in the past timeline eleanor dies from eating very poisonous plants and so it's just sort of like i guess get into her head or understand the sort of motivation there they take this sort of much lower of a dose but they take this tea that is laced with something and then they mm -hmm. go out into the wooded area near Brookhans and they sort of go on bad trip I guess Audrey is the one that has a really bad trip and she's seeing weird stuff and they, they just kind of put it down to the weird tea that they drank mm -hmm. and you think oh well was it the tea or was something actually happening yeah. and I feel like yeah Rowan's kind of really articulated it well there were like you just didn't really believe it as much because you felt oh well they can explain that with technology or they could have they've yeah. done they've you know set it up and you just didn't feel the threat as much as you did in the past I feel yeah especially as it kind of starts getting good and then you you know Caroline Audrey's mother the screen the screen queen turns up and then that same chapter is kind of the end of what you hear about the production because mm -hmm. then it turns to kind of um they go to Noel's mm -hmm. gig and they have a kind of confrontation between Harper Merritt you know and Audrey and find out they were, that they were all in on it mm -hmm. which I, I, I guess what it's trying to do there is you know that they're all playing bad heroin yeah and they're all equally oh God, sorry. you know um but fine, it's like <laughs> <laughs> they're all equally kind of used using each other and they all are kind of using each other because you know they will have this idea that it's going to be you know a popular kind of thing and if you know they think the other's reaction is genuine it yeah. would be cooler <laughs> but yeah yeah i really thought i mean I, I didn't know if it was just because of my my like love of film i just didn't feel like i could see that production as well as i should have been able to and but i could really see the sections at brook you know i was yeah. like gothic i know the genre it's, like i know what the yeah. visuals would be i know what it would look like whereas ironically the bit where they're filming the film i'm like i, I don't know what they're how that would look Especially on screen as i feel like they didn't like how did they have enough material yeah i kind of feel because you know it stops after no Noel's concert and they they kind of say yeah. that they've stopped doing all the kind of gimmicky things and they're mm -hmm. all kind of you know some of them aren't staying on set yeah i anymore. mean i mean also there's the and, bit in the orangery which then they get told not to you you know but all three of them have a sort of intimate moment yeah, in the orangery they, which yeah. t takes place off script i would yeah. say and then audrey kind of threatens Bo and says if you put this in i'll walk from the project mm -hmm. so it, you do wonder like what did they actually get that was worth showing yeah. at the end of the day yeah, exactly. you know? <laughs> yeah. um so i think yeah that's for me why you know it does sort of the modern storyline does pale a little bit i was really gunning for it when you know obviously it's about film that's my thing and i really like this idea of them sort of being played off against each other and the sort of conflict that would cause i mean it's very like you know classic thing like you know midsummer you know you arrive in a weird location you don't know who you can trust and it's very disorientating not knowing where you are and especially if spooky things are also happening concurrently and it just like i said this i don't i don't think the sense of threat was there as much as she was able to sort of create it in the past bit yeah because there were some more consequences like you know the body count is higher in the past storyline people dying from this curse people dying from 
um various different things yeah. um yeah are we ready for that yeah, yeah. <laughs> um god it's all wizardry isn't it um next question i'm really enjoying this oh what Ooh. do the recurring yellow jackets and mean they... and at what moments do they appear i feel like i'm a teacher yeah. this is like a gcse question girls get your answers in <laughs> I love that I've just noticed that you can see that you've been watching Bob Mutt, Bob Mutt, Bob Sparkus <laughs> on the other tab. I call it. Yeah. yeah, love that. Great. But this is a picture of like a nest, yellow yeah. jacket's nest. So, so this is essentially kind of... what Clara steps in yeah. and then she breaks a sort of papery material and then it releases a, presumably thousands of them. Um, and I don't, honestly, I, we wrote this question and I'm looking at it now and I'm like, I don't know why I had to say, I think what we thought was interesting and I think they play on it a little bit in the book too, is the wasp wasps thing. So obviously wasp is an acronym for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And it, it is talking about a certain brand of middle upper class american at that time you know traditional family values very anti-queer anti sort of going against the status quo very sort of traditional money come from a moneyed background um, and obviously that you know the children of those families are the kind of girls you would find at brook haunts um and it's interesting that then wasps like actual physical wasps mm. sort of becomes their downfall in a way mm. and then you see in in the modern day, obviously, you wouldn't really consider um, our, our playing bad heroines in the modern day wasps, but they do both, they all sort of come from different facets of wealth in a way. So yeah. Merritt had a very privileged upbringing. Her mother was an academic and she was always at Brook Hans when she was a child. Um, and obviously you had the time and space to write a novel at 16. I mean, that's not everyone can do that if you're struggling to get food on the table. And then Harper does come from a fairly, like, sort of a modest background, but then she's yeah. discovered pretty early on. So she doesn't, I guess, she when we meet her in the novel, she's successful. Yeah. And then Audrey's mother was a screen queen, you know, probably very... Um, comfortable, at least, if not, yeah. if not, you know, rich. And it's, it's kind of vaguely mirrors the kind of between Clara and um, Flo. I, I, I don't think, um, you know, um, Flo, Flo's kind of from a kind of European background. So, mm -hmm. so, so I, I don't think she's actually not rich, but just not of the kind of background that is kind of, doesn't quite fit in. Yeah. Um, so it is that kind yeah. of, you know, one person that you know is kind yeah. of different but yeah and i guess yeah so obviously we have the yellow jackets appearing at different moments in the text and i don't know i don't know if it was too much because it appears a lot so we have in the past storyline obviously we have flo and clara being engulfed by the yellow jackets um eleanor then dies by eating the angel's trumpet flowers um but then Libby, the principal, has a encounter with sort of hallucinating yellow jackets while she's in the bath. Um, or was it? Or was it a hallucination? Yeah. And then while that's happening in modern day, Audrey has an encounter with them when she's home alone, um, and some the Brook Hans like anthem plays on her like iPod, and then you find out later that was actually Noel that. Yeah did it to freak her out basically because they were secretly filming but they didn't do the bits with the yellow jackets yeah but they and didn't they, and they didn't release yeah. the yellow jackets and also harper has it in her actual jacket she puts it on she gets stung and then she gets a tattoo of a yellow jacket and then Merritt has one just on her desk at home so they each have their sort of individual encounters and obviously when they get to brook hans and they're filming they encounter yellow jackets there's a swarm of oh, them yes. and harper's like instagramming yeah. it you know pics or it didn't happen yeah, sort of. i think it's it's like a kind of ghost with some you know yeah so kind of swarm that looks like yeah. a figure of a person and also obviously it ends with them kind of on the red carpet um at, where is this like can or something yeah 
Um, and they're being kind of followed around by there's the buzzing jacket, isn't it yeah. and if the yellow jackets aren't present it does talk about like a buzzing or a hum in the air and that sort of you know something's about to happen at this point and then mm-hmm. Ava who we haven't talked about yet Ava another character who is Libby's biological daughter who grows up away from Libby believing that Libby is actually her aunt but then she finds out secretly that it's her mother and then we meet Ava in a tree and it turns yeah. out that she's... There's a whole chapter near the end and I just <laughs> felt like why are we being introduced to this new person when it's just yeah. ending and... and so she's in a tree and then she's eating a fruit and the yellow jackets come and then she falls out of said tree so it's sort of I mean it is a bit obvious to like, but you know it is sort of a bad omen in a way a sort of signal for right, it's for kind a of like in horror movies when you know there's the, mm. the kind of score goes kind yeah of the, you know and you're kind of anticipating something, something <laughs> happening um yeah which is mm-hmm. interesting and obviously they're you know um you know known for being you know quite you know, dangerous and stinging people multiple yeah. times. And, yeah, um, and I think it's interesting that it's sort of cyclical that, you know, the story of this, these queer girls in the 1900s, they were haunted by yellow jackets and then these modern actresses who are also queer are haunted by yellow jackets. And I don't know, maybe I'm looking into it too much, but it sort of maybe says something about how not far we've come in a way because mm-hmm. these stories are still sort of hampered in some ways by this like weird ominous sort yeah. of cloud I guess that's like hovering mm-hmm. over these women <laughs> yeah no definitely mm-hmm. um it definitely yeah. um, increased my fear of wasps increased your fear of yeah. wasps oh no <laughs> I think it's healthy to have a fear of wasps we like bees, but wasps we don't we don't need. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. I mean, there's that film that you like uh, that's about that, like mass hysteria in a mm. girls' school. The Falling by Carol Morley. Indeed, <laughs> I forgot the name of it. Um. Oh, <laughs> I feel like I'm like snooping when I post up a comment that's like a reply to someone else's comment. I'm like, oh wait, that wasn't for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think we're ready for the next question. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what else we can say about the, the wasps. Ooh, the juicy one, <laughs> the big one. Who is the narrator? Get your guesses in. Um, so obviously we haven't mentioned it yet, which is crazy because this we an hour in and we haven't mentioned this key aspect of the novel which is that it's told by somebody by an unnamed narrator and we have pretty extensive footnotes throughout the novel so you'll get these like yeah. tiny asterisks like honestly you need a microscope i would get to the bottom of the page and there'd be a huge footnote and i'm like wait where was the asterisk and you have to like go back up and be like where was it um so you get these long footnotes that sort of give you a bit of background and you're really being like taken through the story by somebody like you're addressed directly it's like readers remember this or readers this is going to come up later um and so you're sort of promised that this is somebody that is relevant right at the start Um, it says by the end you'll be you'll know a lot about me or something yeah and by the end we don't (laughs) Well, I think, I don't know what other people think, but I think it's most likely to either be just someone unknown who we don't know or to be Merrick because we know Mm -hmm. that she is writing a book about About the experience of filming. The happenings that were Yeah, so she starts kind of right, you know, when she's on set, yeah, it all herself. And it's also alluded as well that there were some parts that she left out of her original Brooke Hans novel. So maybe that this is like the seminal text of Brooke yeah. Hans and the filming of the film, and like everything goes into this one big document, and that's Meg Merritt's like magnum opus, right? Yeah. But I don't know if that's just a bit of a, a cop out 
or mm-hmm. I don't know. It, it, I don't know it because then, like then there are there are things answer, that you don't so. understand how she would know. Like the the, yeah. the conversation between, especially this. Well, I mean, we guess we could talk about the ending now because the narrator, I guess, plays a part in that, and 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 we waited until the end, so it seems fitting to talk about the ending. Um, there's that conversation between Libby and Addie that we both have no idea why it was relevant <laughs> or what that was even telling us but how would Merritt know that because who who was there because after that conversation you know well, spoiler we, if you're if you're still that, if you're still here and you haven't read that, it but Libby dies so no, who, we, there's that bit where it, they say um she was seen in a photo by, or someone oh. like her who looked very like her was seen in a photo with Sarah so oh, okay. you're kind of there's a question on whether she did actually die mm. um but other than that what's what I found confusing <laughs> about the ending is so so what did you guys take yeah, away we from ha- the end <laughs> yeah, that's because I I just found it Oh, really? that's interesting. Simone as the narrator of the novel. Yeah, I suppose. Or like her or spirit Because it's all becomes about, they're all kind of reincarnations of mm. previous spirits. I mean, you can get kind of see that in with Harper, you know, Flo and, mm. you know. Audrey. Audrey. Oh, and then I guess Merritt and Eleanor. Yeah. Because Eleanor is like the observer of you know she yeah. observes the other two and then i guess merit being the writer of the group takes that role as the kind of one to observe everything from the outside <laughs> same yeah no i thought it was very especially on audiobook because i i listened to large sections of it on audio just simply to get through the length bit but the narrator i found really got that sort of cadence that really hypnotic quality yeah. of somebody who knew something that you didn't know and it really helped you sort of you know be compelled onwards i yeah, think it was definitely. it was really yeah really well done yeah, yeah merit or addy <laughs> yeah, same so, so same addy <laughs> is a kind of ring so, so there's <laughs> so there's the um oh I've uh, forgotten the name the the I Barrett. wish I wish we could just be like and here's Emily to explain it to us but, but unfortunately we don't have Emily no here. no <laughs> so, so so there's um oh we haven't even talked about the whole thing with Harold um oh, God, I forgot <laughs> so, about so, Harold. so so Harold um is a kind of a very rich. Man. older man who was kind of on his last legs <laughs> and okay, he was he was and he knew was. he was on his last legs and we, it was very interested in kind of magic and kind of spiritualism and had befriended um you know madame Barrett, who's of a kind of family of psychics? spiritual psychics mm. and spiritual people for, from france and um they've got a link with um the first kind of owner of the kind of rook haunts kind of land which was um someone in their family had first bought the land and kind of ran away from the barrett family to go there and it was too um, women in a relationship, and they had a daughter. Is this Simone? Who they, which Simone is, is Sim- the daughter. Simone's yeah. the daughter, yeah. and and both the parents died, and then Simone was living on her own, and, and the kind of whole Barrett family were kind of, you know, against. Yeah. I mean, you're you're not really clear if that they were against the kind of uh, lesbian aspect, or of whether it was just that maybe she wasn't. Simone wasn't being grown mm. up in the kind of spiritual, you know, way that Lineage. they wanted. Mm. Yeah, it's unclear why yeah. there was that. And then, upset. yeah, so basically, towards and, the, the end, there's this big 
thing at the end and you, there's this thing that's been alluded to this thing with the rash brothers and then you find out that basically when simone was living on this land that these guys the rash brothers were building spite well they were building breakwater yeah. and they wanted simone's land and she asked Which them, was... you know are you giving me a fair yeah. price they weren't his men and <laughs> and you know basically she refused to sell to them because they were disrespectful men and uh then one of them one of them sorts of lets it go and then the other one gets just a bit weird about it and starts building spike tower which is you know it, basically uh, to spoil to spoil her, her view. view and that's why it's called spike tower because he built it out of spite um and that's where you know libby is currently residing in like many years later and so and then yeah he gets even more obsessed because this woman is like unfazed by this bloody tower and he ends up sort of creeping on her sees her bathing like naked in a lake and when she gets out he attacks her and then he tries to assault her i can't remember yeah. if he's successful no, but yeah, then the struggle him. yeah she scratches him and in the struggle she he, dies he kills her and buries no, so, her right so, so later so, so so that whole thing happens and then both the Rash brothers go to like a local, aptly named a Rash. Yeah, yeah, a, a <laughs> unwanted, a local kind of, um, you know, a part of the town, and they talk to some of the locals, and uh, you know, they kind of get, um, what do you call it? You know, bigged up to, you know, do something <laughs> about this woman Simone, which they all kind of don't approve of um and then you know they go and find her but trying to burn the spike tower and then they kill her and well one of them kills her right i think they both do oh, i think they both because there's that bit where she's like they're like oh um you know simone could handle one of them but not both of oh them. true yeah, 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 yeah and then the kind of you know previously before some, they kill Simone she's also <laughs> like done some kind of magic things that kind of curses their land and they find you know their yeah. kid, the Rash Brothers kids oh, are yeah, like they're ill, Ill and, yeah crops and, and stuff and then it stops but then obviously it comes up again when Addy arrives um and what years later yeah, yeah, years later it starts. Because I mean, she's a Varric, right? Because I think she's supposed to be a reincarnation of S Simone. Simone. So, so the Harry I, Brook can't say I just want to get Varric. clear. Who understood that? <laughs> Can we get a show of hands in the chat? Who feels confident that they understood what was going on? Because... As you can probably tell from the way we've rambled, yeah. neither of us really do. Um, it's it's hard because it's. I kind of feel like it was like, you know, there was some kind of. It was confusing also because how the kind of because it obviously, you know, in the nineteen hundreds thing, Libby's gone, and you kind of feel like Addie's going to stay there with Ava, um, and she's kind of linked with Simone um and you feel like it's a kind of repetition of Simone's kind of upbringing because because um Addie kind of wanted Libby to stay and for them to be Both grow, raise Ava ra mm. raise Ava but then it ends up going to a descendant of the Brookhans which is kind of seems like the mm. more kind of um patriarchal kind yeah. of you know um the thing you know that kind of Addie was uh, up against it's and not just us it's it just thank god it felt very confused yeah and i think what i felt was a major personal letdown for me is that we start this book and we are told that you know this this mary mclean this salacious writing is bewitching these girls and that's why all of these horrible things are happening that's why these girls are dying 
And then you sort of get this explanation at the end for why the land is cursed. You know, a, a murder of a woman took place on this land and mm. therefore it's cursed throughout, you know, generations. It and you're thinking, so well, why weird. do we have two reasons for the curse? You know, what does, what does Simone's death have to do with Mary McLean writing a book years and years later on? You and know? also it just felt a bit like, okay, obviously, you know, Oh great! It's another curse started by a woman killed by a man. Yeah, exactly. It's just like yeah, well, for a book that was sort of championing heroines, you're like, well, why does this all start from a woman being killed by a man? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And then we get this, you know, Libby was pregnant, and we get this reveal that the guy that pregnated her was a Verrett, maybe because his name was Simon Everett, which was meant to be like Simone Verrett. Yeah, but then and it wasn't even. The because there was an extra <laughs> R and they kind of make a joke of that but I'm also like but oh uh, yeah it's really unclear as to sort of where it goes because then Abby had Abby Addy has this big sort of confession scene to Libby and and says that oh you know the guy <laughs> that you this, were with like, was a Vera and and all of, but then like why does that matter I don't know but I love that at the end that there's like a line which is like Addy who'd been waiting you know waiting to like present her soliloquy her yeah. whole time of it and now she is mm -hmm. going to do it uninterrupted and then there was just like pages and pages of like yeah. this thing that just and it's like, like go girl give us nothing because we don't understand anything and i think i think yeah that's what made it a little bit of an underwhelming finish for me because for such an exceptionally long but I mean I say exceptionally long I mean it's not it that but like it feels it longer so than it is and for such a, a behemoth of a book that covers so many different time periods so many different characters has so many different plot and thread elements for you to still have unanswered questions at the end that's just a bit silly I think but like I, I literally left the book for with more questions than I had about 100 pages in you know and yeah. I just think Maybe like maybe that's the point because you know Brooke no, Hunt is just Kurt, but is. like I don't think it is either. I, don't, I just because... don't see how the book lines up with this Barrett family. Yeah, I don't think those two. But I, can but coalesce. I also I I think you know like there's books that I love which you know have a lot of unanswered questions, like for instance Picnic at Hanging Rock, which I, I can think of immediately because there's I a think lot of aspects that this book takes a lot from this yeah, which it from takes that. but they do give us an answer it's mm. just that we have more questions from that answer so it's not even like it's you know meant to have a you know kind of ambiguous ending mm. it's not it's just the ending is confusing yeah so it's it just so that's makes it because I love books that are kind of ambiguous but I don't think that's what she was trying you know attempting with this book I think she wanted to wrap it up in this way but it's yeah. just not very I satisfactory. think it's meant to be a sort of directory of Brooke Hans right yeah. so you know what happened in the past you know all about the filming process for the movie you know about Simone and Breakwater and Spike Tower the origins of these places um, and if it is Merritt who is the narrator, that makes sense because obviously she wrote the non-fiction version of Brooke Hunt. She probably knows it better than anybody else. It. And she now is the owner of it. So it's is so, she gonna be cursed. Yeah. So, well so it's like is this the directory of like a sort of a history of? But obviously it's not as simple as that because we jump around from time periods. But is that what it's functioning as? Because that that you know that makes it less of a story and more about the place but then the people are so central to the place it's like you can really detach them I don't know it is hard yeah <laughs> but no it is it I, yeah I don't know because obviously we had a few I mean basically everyone say that they didn't understand the ending I mean how did that impact on your enjoyment of the book like did you not mind that you didn't understand was it sort of like oh I enjoyed it so I don't care or did that sort of ruin it for you I feel like it definitely like you know there were parts that I really loved about the book I think my favorite you know kind of reading about favorite chapters I love the chapter with Eleanor and the angel's trumpet um I was all there for the kind of botanical gothic yeah you know feeling and I love the um 
you know, your whole chapter of Libby in the bath. Mm-hmm. That was that was a good one. Yeah. And and you know, like um Yeah, yeah a lot of the yeah. kind of There are clear images to me that stand out and I guess yeah. that sort of makes sense that it's also yeah filmish in that sense that there are definitely images and sequences but as a whole when you kind of it's, step back it, from it it begins to fall apart a yeah. little bit for me. and I feel like the ending kind of cemented that in a way is that mm. I just felt you know um unsatisfied yeah. with it really yeah okay so there's a comment is <laughs> Favorite. yeah mate this yeah. is the thing because we they don't really exist in any other narrative and also i don't ever think because the modern day heroines make reference to the rash brothers mm-hmm. but they never talk about the verettes or the verets or whatever they're bloody called so it just seems like completely out of the it's like a, a conversation that only happens between addy and libby and then what like mm-hmm. what, <laughs> like who else knows about that obviously this narrator does but it's, you know what? What is this? And you know, unless there's sort of and then this weird, like the weird, like voodoo it. that made Libby's <laughs> baby Harold's baby. I mean, yeah, that what? is really that confuses me because it's Brooke Hunt and the Barretts that organise that, but then the kind of word players that it's like Simone, but then Simone's kind of. Detached, detached. From so it was like, what is the curse? Is it Brookhans, the land, the place? Is it this family of psychics from France, or is it this book written by a teenager? Like it just felt like the. But maybe that's the whole thing. It's like a cocktail of these things that all you know were drawn together, and that I don't know. Like, <laughs> pick a curse, you know. Like which which one is the sort of? I guess maybe like the book sort of enhances like you know maybe like makes the girls more more frenzied and then therefore the like that buzzes up the yellow jackets mm-hmm. from the land and then that it activates the curse but like you just didn't understand like you know again okay, you've got a string of deaths happening and your 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 human curiosity is to be like why are these deaths happening and that's obviously what they're trying to figure out too and so they start to ban the book you think oh is it the book and then you find out oh wait maybe it's the land and it's the wasps or then you just get this whole side plot about the family which also it's unsatisfying because you just hear about this whole story with Simone right at the end so you haven't like got any feelings towards her or Mm -hmm. anything it's it's just like well she dies (laughs) you know like it's just I don't know there's yeah I like that 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 you know you do get a sort of happy narrative I was expecting a death on set or something like one of the main three to die in a horrific way and in a way it's nice that didn't happen but I was a little bit underwhelmed I think by that Mm -hmm. um and you do get the sense that I guess you know Harper and Merritt will will have some sort of relationship with or without Audrey going forward well, when it ended them. kind of with Merritt and Audrey kind of mm, more yeah more that's true and that. Harper was a bit and, and yeah, put well, out. I think I think Merritt was kind of not wanting I mean I, I guess it's there's this whole thing in the, all the different groups there's all these kind of there's one instigator mm. and you know I guess Merritt you know Harper's kind of the instigator in that you know trio and maybe you, Merritt felt like no I'm not gonna go for that life you know um because you know obviously with Flo and Clara you know Flo is kind of the instigator and uh, and then you know with um, and you think it's strange because you know obviously you know they're Flo Clara like like, they're all obsessed with this Mary McLean book and it bewitches all of them and then like Merritt and Harper like quite regularly quote the Mary McLean book but they're like sort of fine I don't know unless maybe like it's power lessens over time because it's not a secret to have those sort of feelings anymore like obviously in the age of instagram yeah. where harper is blogging her every bloody thought i guess that, though there is you know, you know her back you know um harper's background is that that she, <laughs> <laughs> that she um her family disapproved of her being mm. queer and they only really started approving of it when they were. She was bringing money in. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So, so there is something. And that I like that. Change. That like obviously in the past timeline it was P 
people who are outwardly not for you being queer and then you know the sort of conception or misconception is that nowadays everyone's fine with it we've got pride month we've got corporations going rainbow for pride but like the actual attitudes themselves haven't changed that much and there are still people that get you know abandoned by their families for being queer and and like i said it it, i like that with the the yellow jackets that sort of cyclical nature of sort of that and and that be you know what it is to be a queer woman you know growing up yeah Um, i I think i think even still today and you can see it in the 1900s narrative when there, there was you know all this kind of historical stuff about how there was kind of girl crushes you know and you know kind of these kind of play relationships and the girls schools like and it still goes on to today I think this feeling is that people are comfortable with a certain amount of queer Mm. but then when it comes you know whether it's like then kind of cemented by actual you know sexual you know um happenings or or like you know it's close within the family it's like you know that there's a lot of people who are like oh I'm fine with gay people but I don't want my kid to be gay yeah you know and it's it's always like like, oh I'm worried that they'll be bullied and so it's kind of like you know there's obviously there's this homophobia that's you know still rampant now Mm -hmm. but it's kind of I guess less obvious because a lot of people kind of okay with it as long as it's at a distance yeah. or like that thing of like oh i'm fine with it but don't shove it down my throat and oh, you're yeah. like oh well the way that heteronormity have been shoved down everyone's throat since the beginning of time yeah, like, yeah. Okay. um but yeah no definitely and i feel you know obviously i was really excited to come to discussion because there is so much in this book to talk about and there is so much we still don't understand and i was i was really excited to get everyone's opinions and i think it is really nice that for once it's like a queer story that everyone's talking about well, not, not everyone but like you can talk about it in this much detail and I like that yeah. because a lot of queer narratives that I've read have been about coming out and I really like that this is different um and it's just it's just it's a gothic horror story and it's a story about filmmaking and um uh, wasps and it just happens to have mm-hmm. queer women in it at the center of it um, and it does deal with the fact that they're queer and they ignore that but it also just sort of lets it be in a way that a lot of narratives now sort of yeah i don't know yeah. I'm, I'm going on a bit <laughs> yeah yeah and i think yeah. i i felt this too in the sense that it takes so long to read that that sense of confusion is there all the way through and the ending just sort of compounds it. Um, and there isn't that really, like I, I was waiting for like an Agatha Christie moment where it's like, you all get sat down in the drawing room and it's like, yeah. here's how yeah. it happened. Like, Which is kind of what he, she yeah. did, but it didn't make yeah. sense. It's like, here are all the clues that you missed. And that's what I liked about, you know, the way Agatha Christie, like it was obviously very tightly plotted. And if you go back and reread her work, the clues are there, you just don't see them. And what I felt with this is that the clues were not there and I didn't see them yeah. because the explanation had nothing Thing to do with the rest of the story yeah. really um and that's what i i think i found frustrating is that i was waiting for this especially when it's been so long you're like okay this is a slow burn we're building to something and then what you build to it, it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense really um yeah yay <laughs> <laughs> or lovers yes <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it was certainly an, a good pick for a book club because I do feel like if yeah, I'd, I feel like if I I'd read it on, it on yeah, my own. yeah, I was gonna say if I'd read it on my own, I would have gone bloody insane by the end. Yeah. I think. So I think, yeah, it is definitely a good book club choice because I'm I'm glad. But then I was so worried because I remember I'm friends with Karis on on Goodreads and I saw that she logged it and hadn't given it a rating and I was like oh my god like what have I done have I made her read this terrible book and then when I obviously got into the thick of the book myself I was like no I get it I get not giving it a rating because there are elements that I love that are like four or five stars and elements that were really quite disappointing so Mm -hmm. I was like I I totally get it but um there's like that responsibility when you have a book club of like if the book's not 
five out of five you, you you feel responsible for like making other people read it especially when the book is this long because it's such a time commitment <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh gosh so i feel like we have to personally thank everyone that did read it for this reason um to discuss with us because uh, you gave up a lot of your life uh, yeah. for, for this little book club and we're very grateful um and you'll be pleased to know that the next one is tiny yeah <laughs> um so we saw yeah i guess we can stop sharing the screen we've reached the end of our beautiful slides um and yeah we can now talk a little bit about the next oh you didn't wait for me <laughs> <laughs> the next the next book how dare you <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> um this is tiny though, so if anyone wants yeah, to read is... this, I promise, if it's shit, which we don't know, but if it's mm -hmm. shit, it's not going to take that much of your time. Um, so this is The Water Cure by Sophie McIntosh, a book that I know virtually nothing about apart from the blurb. I haven't seen any of my friends review it or talk about it. Um, uh, yeah, do you, I don't, do you want to talk about it? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, should I just read yeah. the blurb? Um, Grace, Leah and Skye live in an abandoned hotel on a sun-bleached island beside a poisoned sea. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, their parents raised them there to keep them safe, to make them good. The world beyond the water is contaminated and men are the contamination. But Dude. one day, <laughs> one day, three strangers wash ashore. I'm just thinking of the eggs on the beach. <laughs> I don't know why that just suddenly came out, you know, like when they put the straw up. Um, but men who stare at the sisters hungry, hungrily, helplessly, men who bring trouble. So in a, a lot of ways there are similar kind of themes yes. of the kind of liminal... Yeah, so we have obviously an island girl. of just women and they have a certain way yeah. of behaving and codes of behavior that then gets disrupted by men, which honestly, we've all been there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just love it. It's like literary X on the beach. It's just, yeah. you know, or like, you know, in Wonder Woman, they have just that island of women yeah. and then like Chris Pine descends, which is all right, because I like Chris Pine. But... <laughs> so yeah, this is also fairly easy to get hold of, not like Miss Mary yeah, McLean. So I think it's being compared to kind of the Virgin Suicide. Handmaid's and, Tale. And there's kind says... of... Um, Oh, okay. So this is reminiscent of the Wicker Man as the Virgin Suicides. Ooh. And then someone else yes. says an eerie novel for fans of The Girls, which is a book about a cult, yeah, yeah. and The Handmaid's Tale. So those are all things that we enjoy. Also, someone said feminist fable set by the sea, a female lord of the flies. Yeah. So I guess if you've enjoyed any of those books, you should read this with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yay! Yay! We love enabling book buying. <laughs> but yeah, and it has a very sort of it's cover. Very nice. It's very pretty. Yeah. I usually don't buy with a photograph, but they've done it quite nicely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, I mean, the theme of our book club is a little bit hard to pin down, but ultimately we're interested in stories of women young women liminality and girlhood and also magic and fairy tales and i think yeah. the only book that doesn't quite fit that that we've read was cat's eye but that was more about girlhood and violence and so i think yeah, it's, that's yeah. the vibe for the book club because i don't know if we've you know obviously both of the picks that we've had so far cat's eye and play that heroines were about girls well not girls schools but female female friendships and relationships existing in like a school setting um and i just wanted to make clear that they're not all gonna be in schools <laughs> and that the next the next few oh, are, are we to gonna be... talk about the next few or we, we can talk that, about but, the next few um, i've done a little graphic which i yeah. can try and we have get up now. a graphic showing i think our plan up till December well including just it's september i was gonna september say. yeah, yeah. I'm i was september. on the drive to december but i do yeah, yeah I, was like, I, I don't september. have it till like, um, in december. there we go we've yeah it. so we've got our plan and we've kind of we thought this the water cure would be good vibes for july 
as well. Um, and so let me just share the screen again. Um, There's our beautiful graphic. Yeah. Let me just make it a little bit bigger. So this is obviously the next three months at a glance. Um, so we've got water cure in July. Which is obviously we're in July now. So yeah. it's, it's going <laughs> to be this, at the yeah, end it's, of July. It's this month's book. And so we'll um, discuss it at the end of July. Yeah. And then um, August, we've got Pandora's Jar, which is our first ever nonfiction book as yet in the book club. And that is about women in the Greek myth. So we thought it would be quite a nice pick for August, you know, the height of summer. We can all yeah. vicariously travel to Greece and learn about cool women through this book. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's been on my TBR for a long time. I don't want to read it. So um, that will be fun. And then... And then we've got uh, Shirley Jackson, which I'm incredibly excited for. Um, Hangs the Man, which is the book that, you know, um, the recent film Shirley was uh, kind of semi-based on. Um, and it's kind of, a, you know, a get, you know, it's set at a kind of college. Um, so that's why we thought it would be quite good in September. Yeah, it's um, about a college girl who goes missing. Um, yeah. So and it's kind of like of, creepy, think, autumnal vibe. I think there's because... also a lot of, you know, um, kind of you're not quite sure what's reality and what, yeah. what is not. So it's it's supposed to be very good. And yeah. Shirley Jackson is obviously iconic. <laughs> <laughs> she is. But, and yeah, um, I think Shirley's on Netflix, so... Oh my god, can't oh, yeah. you guys should watch it definitely. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful film, and it really I mean, I say it's not having read a Shirley Jackson, novel, but it really captures that essence of not knowing what's real and what's not, and capturing that very kind of claustrophobic paranoia of womanhood. Um, and I, 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 I love that film very much, and I think it would pair very nicely with this novel, like a good wine, <laughs> yeah. Um, Yay! We love, <laughs> we love illegal behaviour. Yay! Yay! So yeah, obviously if anyone already owns these books, it would be really great to, you know, if you wanted to save them for these months and you can read along with us. And yeah, I don't know if I've got anything else to say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, so, so the kind of main plan is to, you know, have each one kind of, um, on a Friday at the end of the month. Um, Rolling in yeah. the weekend with yeah. a nice little book chat. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for coming and especially thank you to those who waded through the beast that is playing bad heroines. Um, yeah. 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 I just recently got a library card and I'm obsessed. So I'm going to be looking in my library um, for, for some of the next few picks. But um, yeah, so really, honestly, it means it means a lot because even though we only had about six or seven people watching, it just meant so much that the people that were watching engaged with us and and had read the book, and we could have a proper like proper old chat about it. It really felt like we were like all in the same room together. So really, really enjoyed it. So thank everybody, thank you everybody for coming. I was like, thank everybody, thank you everybody for coming, and I'm very excited to hopefully see all of your lovely faces at the end of July for this one. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Oh, Karis, thank you for coming. I felt so bad when I saw that on Goodreads. I was like, oh god. I was really thinking she was going to come in here and be like, I hated it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you so much, and we'll see you all very soon. And thank you again. How many times am I going to say bloody thank you? <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.